I want to direct our attention to Psalm 69. 69th Psalm, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 18, and then we'll skip over to 29 and go to 36. It reads as follows from the New Revised Standard Version. If you don't mind standing for the reading of the Word of God, we ask that you'll stand. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying, my throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. Uh, what I did, not still, must I now restore? Oh God, you know my folly, the wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Do not let those who hope in you be put to shame because of me. O oh Lord of hosts, do not let those who seek you be dishonored because of me. O oh God of Israel, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred and alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me deliver it from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercies, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to me. Redeem me. Set me free because of my enemies. I'm lonely and in pain. Let your salvation, O oh God, protect me. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. Let the oppressed see it and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own that are in bonds. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah, and its servants shall live there and possess it. The children of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall live in it. Thus far, the word of the Lord, you may be seated. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Weary with my crying, my throat is parched. As for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me, deliver, let me be delivered from my enemies and from deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me. Mm. Or deep swallow me up. Or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. I want to preach today from the subject, 
Swamped, but still floating. Swamped, but still floating. Hurricane Helene hit them with a force unlike any they had seen before. Combination of wind and water wreaked havoc upon what had been an oasis. Many had moved to Tampa seeking the milder, gentler climate. And before Helene, they were living their best life. But Helene changed all of that. A matter of hours, what had taken a lifetime to accumulate was reduced to rubble. It wasn't just the physical property. It was the memories tied to the mementos. You know, you know how, it, how it is when, when there are things that, that may not look like much to others, but they look a whole lot to you, not because of their monetary value, but because of the memories that are attached to them. Who gave it to you? What was the occasion? The look on their face as they gave it to you and the joy that your joy brought to them. All gone in the blink of an eye. And as the people emerged from the horror of Helene and began to absorb the assessment of the damage, the warning came that there was another storm approaching with equal, if not greater, force. With the name Helene still fresh on their lips, another name arose possessing an even greater potential for disruption. Milton was coming. Helene was still fresh. They hadn't had time to get past Helene, and here comes Milton. In a small span of two weeks, they jumped from H to M. Helene was gone. Milton was on the way. Buildings and furnishings that had been reduced to rubble with Helene would now become projectiles with Milton. Having survived Milton's wind and rain, thinking that they were safe, the floodwaters came. And the floodwaters are still coming to parts of Florida. They had just begun to replace drywall, repair damage only to see the brand new washed away. And as of yesterday morning, 1.6 million people we're still without power. Wasn't Helene enough? Milton seems to be overkill. How much more can a town take? How much more can a family endure? How much more can a person carry? How much water, how much weight can a life take on before drowning? As I'm speaking... I know that there are those of you who are saying, I may not be in Tampa, but I know those questions. Just had one funeral for a cousin, and now we have one for a niece. Didn't just lose a sibling, I lost a parent. Lost a child and a spouse. Shortly after purchasing the house, the company lays me off. And just when my job ends, I get a diagnosis. How much more? Can one take? Dog died and child is acting crazy. Got one car in the shop, one on life support, the refrigerator is on the blink, and the dryer doesn't even dry clothes anymore. I'm up to my neck trying to stay afloat. How much more trouble? How much more disappointment? How much more devastation must I show? I am swamped. I'm up to my neck. That's where we find the psalmist. In this instance, it is David. We aren't given the particulars. Some scholars posit that it was composed during the time of Absalom's rebellion when David is made to flee under the cover of darkness for fear of his life. The son whom he spoiled, along with Ahithophel, his most trusted counselor, have risen against him, turning the hearts of many away from him. Under the cover of night, 
he leaves with family and a few soldiers still loyal to him. And the, and the Bible says that they were weeping as they went. David is swamped. Listen to the words that he describes, uh, that he uses to describe himself. Up to my neck in deep mire, no foothold in deep waters. Flood sweeps over me, weary with my crying. Throat is parched, eyes grow dim, hated without a cause, falsely accused, stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Subject of gossip. That's overwhelming, isn't it? That's enough to send you off the edge, over the cliff. And yet for those of us who know David's story, we know that he doesn't go over the edge. He doesn't go off the cliff. With the floodwaters coming and his being up to his neck, he doesn't drown. He was swamped, but he stayed afloat. I believe that that's somebody's story right now. Floodwaters being up to your neck, you have not drowned. You're still floating. With the crushing and the crazy, you haven't gone off the cliff, hadn't jumped off the edge. You're swamped, but you're still floating. With the rubble piled high, you haven't jumped off the bridge. Waters are raging, the waves are choppy, and somehow you are still afloat. Folk, folk are sitting by you and still don't know that you're floating. They don't know the swamp. They don't know what surrounds you. They don't know what's, what's on you. You're still floating. And the question is, how do you do it? How do you stay afloat when water is up to your neck and has the potential to go over your head? It's a matter of buoyancy. Buoyancy, buoyancy, buoyancy is defined as an upward force which determines whether an object will float or sink. Buoyancy measures two competing forces, the downward pressure of the object on the fluid and the upward pressure of the liquid on the object underneath it. And there are three types of buoyancy. There's positive buoyancy in which an object is lighter than the fluid that it displaces. There's negative buoyancy when an object is denser than the fluid displaced and it causes it to sink. And then there's neutral buoyancy. That occurs when the weight of an object is equal to the fluid that it displaces such that it neither sinks nor floats. It's able, like that middle person, to exist within the water and move forward and not upward. Floating is where the pressure at the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top. To stay above the water, you got to have more underneath you than the weight that is on you. And as that is the case in swimming, so it is the case in life, my brothers and sisters. In life, what is under you must be greater than what's on you. That which upholds you must be greater than that which is over you. Spiritual buoyancy occurs through maintaining an upward pressure that is greater than or equal to the downward pressure or pressures that confront you. That spiritual buoyancy is what keeps you afloat without being swamped. And the text before us, this psalm, gives us several factors in spiritual buoyancy. If you want to know how folk are able to stay afloat while being swamped, first of all, a continuous love for God will help you stay afloat while you're being swamped. In verse 9, David speaks of the zeal for the Lord's house consuming him. David's desire for God was reflected in his desire to build a, a house for God. Uh, God says, no, you can't, you can't do it. Your, your son is going to do it. At this time, he is separated from the tabernacle, which represented the ruling and reigning presence of God with him and the people. 
While he doesn't have the tabernacle, he still has a desire for God. And he desires the presence of God. And that desire burns on the inside. You see, the absence of the trappings, the absence of the, of the physical reminders does not lessen his desire. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The, the absence of, of the saints does not diminish his desire. He still has that desire for the Lord. The word for zeal describes a strong emotion whereby the possession of the object is desired by the subject. It is a passionate, consuming zeal that is focused on God. And when you have this type of zeal, it results in the doing of God's will and the maintenance of God's honor. In other words, this is no ordinary love. No ordinary love. <laughs> this is a love of depth. It's a love whose emotions promote action. It's a love that says nothing is going to separate you from being with God and from doing God's will. You see, friends, a love for God, a passion for God helps you stay afloat while you're being swamped because you know it is God who is keeping you. God is your refuge, and underneath you are his everlasting arms. When you have a passion for God, stuff can be going wrong, but you know that there is still somebody who loves you and whom you love. A love for God keeps you afloat but not only a love for God keeps you afloat but a life of committed prayer will keep you afloat verses 1 through 12 provide the cataloging of what overwhelms David but it's in verse 13 that we, are, that we see a shift with the words but as for me my prayer is to you O Lord and verses 1 through 12 speak to what is on and over him. What, 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 what is the gravitational pull above him that seeks to press him down? But he gets to verse 13 and he starts talking about what's underneath him. That's pushing him up. As for me, my prayer is to you, O oh Lord. He shifts his focus from the overwhelming to the overarching. You see, brothers and sisters, there are issues that overwhelm him, but there is the Lord who is overarching. The Lord is above what overwhelms him. What is over him is still under the Lord. The Lord is sovereign over what is swamping him. And so he commits himself to pray to the Lord. Rather than succumb to the weight of the concerns, uh, he would submit the concerns uh, to the Lord. And this commitment to prayer is a commitment to keep on praying while stuff hadn't changed. Flood waters still coming. Storm still raging. Enemy still advancing. And with that, David determines... To keep on praying. You see, because sometimes, many times, uh, when we don't see things changing after we've been praying, we stop praying. Because the enemy tricks us into believing if your prayers were effective, things would have changed by now. No, no, David, da David said, stuff ain't changed. Water's still coming. Level still rising, but I'm going to keep on praying. Why? Because the next words of his prayer are equally important. He says, at an acceptable time, O oh God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. He keeps on praying, believing that there is an acceptable time for God to move on his behalf. That is to say, what hadn't happened for him is not because of a lack of God's love for him. It's just a matter of time. God 
will answer him. You see, there are times when we are swamped, we're tempted to stop praying, what hadn't happened, what hadn't changed, enemy causes us to believe that the seeming lack is an absence of God. No, 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 no. That's when you got to commit yourself to prayer. That's when you've got to devote yourself to pray. When it seems as if you have taken all that you can take and you are up to your neck and it is over your head, when it seems as if the prayers that you've prayed before did nothing to stem the tide, you got to keep on praying. Jesus teaches us we ought to always pray and not faint. He tells the, the story of this widow who takes her case to a judge. He's a, he's a crook, doesn't fear God, doesn't fear people. And every day that, that widow just keeps going on, keeps going on, keeps going on. And though that judge does not fear God, that is, he does not have a moral sensibility. He does not fear people. He does not have a people sensibility. But because that woman just kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on coming, that judge says, because you just keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, though I don't fear God, though I don't fear people, I'm going to answer you just to get you off of my back. And then Jesus says, uh, if this unjust judge who doesn't fear God, doesn't fear people, will hear this woman because she keeps on coming to him, how much more will your father give justice to you who keep on coming? And then he says, but will he find faith, Lord? Will he find faith demonstrated by your keeping on coming? Committing to yourself to prayer is fueled by a confidence in the one to whom you are praying. It is knowing something about God that prompts the commitment to prayer. It is believing that God is God and that God is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It is trusting in the fact that God can and God will answer that God will show himself strong on behalf of those who fear him. It is knowing that there is an acceptable time for the manifestation, an acceptable time for the showing, an acceptable time for the answering, and that God will keep you afloat until you see it. It is that I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It is saying that he will keep me afloat until the acceptable time and I'm wondering are there any people who can testify that God kept you afloat until the acceptable time came he may not have come when you wanted him to come but when he came he was right on time and between the time of your prayer and the time of his answer he kept your head above the water he kept food on the table he kept clothes on your back he kept the roof over your head. He kept sanity in your mind. He kept health in your body. He kept you until the time came. You got to be a continuous love for God. You got to have a life of committed prayer. But there, there's something else that we see. A determined praise will keep you afloat. Uh, verses 13 through 29, laying out the particulars of his petition to God. Then David makes a determination in verse 30. David says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I'll magnify him with thanksgiving. With everything that has gone awry, water still coming, Wave still choppy. David determines, I'm going to praise God. He feels swamped, but he says, I choose to praise God. I choose to express my joy in who God is. That desire and that determination indicates that he hadn't lost everything because he still has the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is still his strength. 
And with all of the churn and the chop, he stays afloat by way of praise. I'm talking to somebody who knows when you are swamped, when it seems like the floodgates have been let loose against you, you tread water by determining to praise God. The power of the express joy in the person of God is what will keep you afloat until your help comes. The joy in God being sovereign. The joy in God's name still being a strong tower. The joy of God being refuge and strength. The joy of God being light and salvation. The joy of God being the very strength of your life will keep you afloat. Praise is what kept our forebears afloat. It kept joy in their souls. It kept them afloat until the Brown Board, Board of, Vers Board of Education versus, 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 versus Kansas overcame Plessy versus Ferguson. It kept them afloat until the Civil Rights and Voting Acts rights came. And somebody can testify, you're treading water right now. You are doing the egg beater. You are, you are dog paddling right now. That's why you came to the sanctuary. That's why you logged on. You determined I'm not going to give way to defeat or depression or despair. I am going to praise God. Who am I talking to who can say I've been treading water? Your determined praise has kept you afloat. It kept you from giving up, from giving in. Your determined praise that I will bless the Lord at all times. Your determined praise bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord oh my soul and forget not all of his benefits. Kept you afloat with the reminder of who God is. The power that God has the promises that God has made the provision and supply that God has made available the I will praise the determined praise is keeping somebody afloat and the wonder of it all is that very few people know that you are treading water because they see your head above the water they don't see what's going on under the surface they don't know that the chop and the churn that you're facing they don't know that you're doing the egg beater or the dog paddle all oh, that they see is your hands lifted up. They don't know that you're treading water. They hear the voice raised in song. They don't know that you're treading water. They see the clapping of your hands and the dancing in your feet. Uh, they don't know that you're treading water. They don't know that you're swamped, but you're still floating. I wonder am I talking to somebody right now? I woke up treading water. I got in the car treading water. I came came into the sanctuary treading water. I joined the praise team in the singing of the songs, but I've been treading water. But my praise has kept me afloat. My praise has kept my head above the water. You stay afloat by a determined praise commitment to prayer a continuous love for God but then lastly spirit, the spiritually buoyant life stays afloat by laying down some faith claims laying down some faith claims beginning with verse 35 David starts laying out some faith claims. He says, God will save Zion, rebuild the cities of Judah. Servants shall live there. They shall possess it. He starts singing about what God will do. God will show himself to the humble and make them glad. God, God will save Jerusalem and rebuild the people. The people will take possession of the land and those who love God will dwell in safety. His praise of God comes, uh, causes him to, to speak in faith 
that which God will do. He's, he's looking at what still hasn't changed and the waters that still are coming. But he starts making some faith claims. He's talking about what God will do. You see, when you give yourself to determined praise, the power of praising God is in its ability to take you into a place within your spirit wherein you start declaring what God will do. Uh, there is a, a connection made between your joy in the person of God and your faith in terms of the future actions of God. Your faith begins to speak what God will do. You may be over in your head, but God will lift you. God will uphold you. God will maintain you. God will sustain you. God will provide for you. you the waters may be coming, but you don't have to drown. You can stay afloat because you have a love for God. You have a commitment to prayer. You have a determined praise. And you start making some faith claims. That's how Job stayed afloat. My God, he was sure enough swamped. He was up to his neck, but he started treading water. My God, in chapter 1, when he was swamped by all the bad news that came his way, he treaded water saying, the Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His praise took him into a place of declaring what God will do. And where he will be. You can hear Job saying, he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. I hear Job making some faith claims. Still swamped by sickness and disease. Ah, oh, things have not turned around for him yet. But he starts making some faith claims. He says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after skin worms have destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom mine eyes shall behold. And not enough. I know that God is keeping me alive. And if God is keeping me alive he's got a reason for me to live and I may not see the full meaning of my reason for living now but I can make a faith claim that will say sooner or later it's going to work in my favor to those who are swamped I've got good news for you there is a way for you you can stay afloat give flame to your love of God maintain your passion for God refuse to allow what's been going on to extinguish your fire for God and if you need some kindling for your fire because the fire is going dim I got some kindling wood for you think about his loving you before you loved him think of his loving you with a love that would not let you go think of his loving you that while you were at your worst he saw you at your best so much love did he have for you that when we were sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard our despairing cry and from the waters he lifted up now safe are we it was that love that sent Jesus to a cross at Calvary to die for our sins and be raised for our justification and God raised him from the dead with all power in his hands and therein is our rescue that's why when Bell was saying talk about the name of Jesus because the rescue is in Jesus the salvation is in Jesus the deliverance is in Jesus and I don't know about anybody else but I can't 
need help but love Jesus because he loved me first and his love lifted me and his love is keeping me afloat. High five somebody and say neighbor stay afloat. Commit yourself to prayer. Keep your eyes on him. Lift up your voice to him and say father I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know if thou withdraw thyself from me me. Oh, where shall I go? Commit yourself to prayer, saying, "It's me, it's me, O oh Lord." Standing in the knee, in the need of prayer, and then make praise your determination. I will bless the Lord. I will praise His name. I will exalt Him. I will extol Him. I will magnify. Him as a matter of fact, hug some to touch somebody and say, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I express my determination. God is my glory and the lifter of my head. He is the keeper of my soul. He is the supplier of my needs. He is the healer of my disease. He is the fighter of my battles. He is the bearer of my burdens. He is the maker of my way. He is the lover of my soul. Lay claim on what God can and God will do. God will come through for me. God will provide for me. God will show up to me. God will turn it around. God will bring the miracle. God will. He'll keep the water at bay. Keep my head So I'm going to look to the, yeah, my help comes from the Lord. Huh. He's not going to suffer my feet to be moved. He'll keep me. <laughs> my strength comes from him. He will see me through because he's the lifter. What I can't live, he lifts. I'll be down like this and he does. Come on, just sing that. I will. 